Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to BTC Radio Audiobook and ASMR. I'm thrilled to be your host today. Over the next few minutes, we'll embark on a journey through the airwaves, exploring diverse topics, sharing stories. So, sit back, relax, and let us be the soundtrack to your day. Stay tuned for an unforgettable experience right here. Tonight you are listening to Jews in Many Lands by Elkin Nathan Adler. Part 2 Jerusalem The Architecture There are no great triumphs of architecture in Jerusalem. It is not an Athens or a Rome. What buildings there are, are connected with religions, and mostly iconoclastic religions. Even the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, with the exception of some tawdry if expensive additions by the Catholics, Roman and Greek, is severely simple. The Mosque of Omar is externally beautiful, but association lends it a glamour it had not otherwise possessed. Well-preserved ruins are disappointingly few, but then it must not be forgotten that Jerusalem has been destroyed fourteen times and is often rebuilt. Some portions of the Cyclopean walls of the Second Temple and of Herod's, notably the Western Wall, have survived all the onslaughts of time and the enemy, but they are grand rather than handsome. Everywhere Jerusalem is more interesting than artistic. The quaintest of its ancient buildings is the so-called Tomb of Absalom, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, close by the Jewish gravestones that cluster at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It is a small square chapel or vault, cut out of the limestone rock, surrounded by about a dozen pillars with ionic capitals, the whole surmounted by a curious, indented cupola, something like that of the pavilion in Brighton. Jews and Gentiles firmly believe in the authenticity of the monument, and to this day our co-religionists are in the habit of throwing stones at the place, so as to impress on their children their undying detestation of a rebellious son. In its present form, it has probably been repaired and restored by the Romans, possibly under Trajan or Hadrian, when the imperial architects followed the fashion and aped the Greeks. But it is quite likely that the tomb chamber was originally cut out of the solid rock by the grief-stricken David, and that tradition is correct in its identification of the cenotaph, despite the comparatively modern alterations which the Romans made. Anyhow, it would not be the only antiquity there which has witnessed that mighty people's origin, development, decline, and fall. The visitor who expects to find even traces of a specifically Jewish architecture must be woefully disappointed. None ever existed, and even the temple itself was probably only an imitation of the masterpieces of Egypt and Assyria, and in style a cross between the two. Jerusalem This is very unflattering, but I am not chauvinist enough to deny that there is a great deal of truth in the statement. It is enough for us that, as trustees for humanity, we held the land and the book. Beggars. As regards its inhabitants, Jerusalem is much better than its reputation. An impression prevails that it is a city of beggars, and I, for one, was fully prepared to find that it was so. I expected that even a week's residence would be rendered intolerable by their pesterings and complaints. But I was most agreeably disappointed, and can honestly say that I was less annoyed by mendicants, during my stay there, than I have been in Paris itself. Of course, there is a frightful amount of poverty, but in the East it is not so obtrusive as in the West, perhaps because it is really less painful. Nor did even the interior of the city seem as dirty as one had feared. It may be because I looked through rose-colored spectacles. It may be because none are so blind as those that will not see. It may be because I have passed through so complete an apprenticeship of dirt in Whitechapel that I am no longer impressionable. Or it may be, and I think this is the true reason, because there was really not so much dirt to be seen. It must not be forgotten that I reached the holy city in holiday time, when half the inhabitants, for there are about 23,000 Jews in a total population of 40,000, were resting from their labors and were dressed in holiday attire, and they and their houses were beautified by their holiday wash. It is very hard to picture to Europeans the actual state of our brethren in Jerusalem. 
The various nationalities there together constitute a mosaic, which is unparalleled in any other part of the world, except perhaps in London, where, however, all differences are swamped in the infinity of sameness which surrounds them. In Jerusalem we meet European, Asiatic, and African Jews. Fez and Bokhara, Yemen and Degestan, Tunis and Persia, the Atlas and the Caucasus, all have their representatives in the religious capital. To all Jews the Hebrew language is a lingua franca, but it is whispered that some Israelite subjects of his Ottoman majesty know a secret language in addition which no non-Jew can understand, and of which I am equally ignorant. Perhaps this is the mysterious language of the Druzes, those extraordinary Unitarians of whom Disraeli gives so vivid an account in Tancred, when he describes his hero's visit to Astarte, the lovely queen of the Ansaray. There are about 70,000 living in the Lebanon and the Horan, and there is also a colony of Druzes in Saft. Sylvester de Sacy wrote a great deal about them in 1828, and a recent paper published in the The Journal of the Palestine Exploration Society completes our very scanty information on the subject. To this day the nature of their language remains one of the unsolved problems of philology. They guard their manuscripts so jealously that they are enjoined to kill any stranger found in possession of their sacred writings. It may well be that their language has been introduced into Jewry by Jews hailing from the Lebanon. Anyhow, the Jews have always had a certain amount of intercourse with them. They were known to and described by Benjamin of Tudela. Dr. Lowy, whose loss was so deeply deplored, knew as much about the Masanian. He fell into their hands in 1838 when they invaded Palestine proper, and inflicted much suffering on the Jews of Saft and Tiberias. A Palestinian Leland is required to throw light upon their secret speech. But the staple dialects of our co-religionists continue to be the Judzio Spanish and Judish Deutsch jargons according as their talkers are Sephardim or Ashkenazim. I do not wish to be guilty of statistics, at any rate more than I can help, and I hope I shall be forgiven if the description of my impressions is as hazy as my diction is slipshod. I am writing these notes discursively and disjointedly from my only two dim recollections of my scamper through the East, and almost the only written material at my disposal are the letters I sent home during the journey. It is true that I jotted down in a notebook some facts and figures as I went on, but I was unlucky enough to trust the book to the tender mercies of my dragoman one night, as we cantered down the mountains and through the ravines to Jericho. He placed it with other articles of mine, mostly requisites of toilet dash, in a saddlebag, but when daylight appeared, the saddlebag had vanished. The Bedouins are perhaps the richer for my soap and brushes, as well as for my notes, and will doubtless have, by this time, thoroughly tested the mysterious properties of those extraordinary adjuncts of civilization. I hope they have found them useful and that the soap agreed with their digestion. In modern, too modern, Jerusalem, I found no difficulty in replacing the brushes and the soap. I still hold, as a curiosity, the receipted bill for the same, written in pure Hebrew, and, after a prolonged use of them, am able to vouch that I got good value for my money. But as to my notebook, I live in fear and trembling that some Bedouin, more knowing than his fellows, may put it to ransom, and that it may fall into the hands of some Jerusalemite who can interpret my scrawl, and may find a few of my hasty criticisms more candid than complimentary. However, I myself must do the best I can without it, and be content with the supplementary information I was able to glean. Russian Jews in Palestine Jerusalem is the only place in the Orient where Yiddish is spoken to any extent. Nowhere else, either in Syria or Egypt, Asia Minor or Turkey, did I come across a single individual who spoke a word of it. It is true that, on board the post boat from Ismailia to Port Said, I met a young apothecary, whose German was of that complexion. He called himself a Viennese, but he hailed from Galicia originally and since from Jerusalem, to which city he was then returning. He did not impress me very favorably, for he made me think him a Pharisee of Pharisees. It was one of the intermediate days of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he was professing the most scrupulous orthodoxy and bemoaning that the exigencies of travel prevented his using a lulab and ethrog. I offered him mine, but he declined to make the blessing over them, protesting that he had never yet made use of such bad ones. 
They had cost me a lot of money, and I felt the snub keenly. Afterwards I came across the man again. He looked me up in Jerusalem, he got there four days after I did, and solicited my good offices to get him admitted a student of the Lionel de Rothschild Technical School, of which more anon. I did not feel particularly beholden to him, but I can soothe my ruffled feelings by the reflection that I put no spoke in his wheel. Through the kindness of that excellent friend, M. Nisim Behar, he is now sawing wood instead of bones, or perhaps carving boxes instead of washing bottles. Probably at least 10,000 Jews and Jewesses speak the Jidish Deutsch dialect in Jerusalem, so that I felt quite at home, and, but for the clearness of the atmosphere, the narrow, vaulted streets, low houses with wooden gratings instead of windows, quaint costumes, and other local colorings, might well have thought myself in the east of London or some other Polish quarter. Half of the Jews and therefore more than a fourth of the entire population are Russians by birth or parentage, and have managed to impress their individuality very decidedly upon their environment. At the time of the Crimean War under Tsar Nicholas, great changes arose in the official treatment of the Jews of Russia. They did good service as soldiers, and it was the government's desire to assimilate them to the rest of the population. There was nothing Machiavellian about the wish at first, though it has since operated cruel wrong and hardship and malignant injustice. Many Jews sooner than give up, as Nicholas desired them to do, their ancient costume, which was accustomed to them more hallowed almost than religion, migrated to the Holy Land. So it happens that the Russian immigrants retain in Palestine the fur-lined caps which have survived in Russia as fittest to counteract the icy blasts of the steppes. They looked very much out of place in Jerusalem, but, curiously enough, their wearers did not seem to find them insupportable in the tropical heat. It was very amusing to see my Polish co-religionists, old and young, and the little boys looked particularly comical, wearing flat circular berettas of black velvet or velveteen, trimmed all round with fur, and, to all intents and purposes, like a large and greasy plate with a broad brown-yellow rim. Underneath this extraordinary covering, which, I am told, is the common headdress of the Russian muzhik, nestle the shaggy locks and beard of the wearers, whose pieth, or corkscrew kiss curls, hanging over each temple, give them a most characteristic appearance. From the neck downward they are ordinary Arabs, but their Tartar physique proves them to be poles apart from the true natives of their adopted land. A Cossidish Dance I never saw a Jew in Jerusalem without his hat on but once, and it happened thus. On Simchath Torah Eve, I paid a visit to the famous Rabbi Judah Leib Diskin. As I entered, I found the rabbi sitting in an armchair, gazing contemplatively into space. Some of the young men of the yeshiva were dancing around the room in rollicking fun, each a pa sol, and one of them, with true oriental hospitality, thought he would honor and gratify me by exchanging his head covering for mine. True, mine was a somewhat battered straw hat and his a crown of fur, but all the same I felt rueful and alarmed when he crowned me, and I am afraid my greetings lost in dignity and impressiveness. In fact, I felt somewhat like Gulliver among the Brobdignagians, when the monkeys patronized him. The style of rejoicing was none the less of great interest. The tune to which they danced, and which in other Cossidish chevres was evidently the favorite, made a deep impression at the time. A musical friend, the Rev. Francis Cohen, has been good enough to transcribe my now half-faded recollections of the Cossidish howl. He says that the harmonization is not very classical, but, double quotes, rather like a Cossid's nightmare after a heavy supper off Beethoven. Mr. Cohen's rendering follows on the next page. I will not be answerable for the consequences, if any fair friend attempts to translate the notes into music, vocal or instrumental. The tune is, I dare say, to be heard in Cossidish communities a thousand miles north of Jerusalem, but there it was evidently the favorite of, well, melodies. Of course, one of the most striking of the peculiarities of the holy city is the total absence of opportunities for amusement, as a young English resident pathetically complained to me. Perhaps with the assistance of M. Nisim Behar's talented wife, an occasional concert in her drawing room will in the future be allowed to relieve the gloom, 
and it would not be surprising if the next English traveler who follows my good example and pays the Jerusalemites a visit has his ears greeted by the familiar strains of Dorothy or Sullivan's incidental music to Macbeth. The Rejoicing of the Law If the tune of the Hasidim is funny, the manner in which they make the Hakafoth, or circuits of the synagogue, during the rejoicing of the law, is funnier still. Each bearer of a scroll is surrounded by three or four men who dance slowly, but with evident gusto and superabundant gesticulation, der Rall true, mit la churlicham ernst. It was comical and shocking to see venerable greybeards pirouetting on their toes like some European fairy of the pantomime, but it was highly appreciated, and I had to simulate satisfaction for fear of being rebuked, as Michael was when she objected to King David's dancing with all his might. A very good illustration of the esteem in which this religious dancing is held is furnished by a story related of the Kabbalist Isaac Luria, in the Rodelheim edition of the Mace Buck published in 1753, and quoted by Dr. Max Grinbaum in his Jidish Deutsche Christomathy. It is related that one Sabbath morning our Isaac told his disciples that he would show them something very extraordinary if they promised not to laugh, and he warned them that whoever break his promise would die within the year. They give the required assurances, and the wonder-worker conjures up, from among the spirits of the vasty deep, seven ghosts, whom he calls up to the reading of the law. Their prototypes in the flesh are no less personages than Aaron the high priest as Cohen, Moses his brother as Levite, and as ordinary Israelites, the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The seventh and last to be called up is King David, and he comes forward jumping and dancing in honor of the law. One hapless Talmud involuntarily bursts out laughing, and, of course, dies that selfsame year. But the rabbi himself does not escape scathless, and the very next story relates how he, too, dies soon after, by way of penalty for being too yielding to his pupil's idle curiosity, and too ready to prostitute to an unworthy love of ostentation that talent which it was death to discover, and with which he was endowed for higher purposes. The late Mr. F. D. F. Makata, himself a great traveler, reminded me that a custom not very unlike the Kassid celebration of Simchath Torah prevails among the devout Catholics of Seville. During Carnival, and also in June and October, a solemn dancing mass is celebrated in the cathedral of that lovely city. The officiating sixteen boys, Caesars, dance in front of the high altar, with plumed hats on their heads, and dressed as pages of the time of Philip III. They wear red and white for Corpus Christi, blue and white for the festivals of the Virgin. The dance is supposed to imitate that of the Israelites before the Ark of the Covenant. One of the popes, more ascetic than his predecessors, objected to thus exposing the mysteries of the Mass to unseemly revelry, and sought to abolish the custom, but the force of public opinion was stronger than the head of the Church, and the dancing Mass at Seville is a solemn institution to this very day. There was dancing that night throughout Jewry in Jerusalem, and the nicest part of the performance was to see the mothers standing quietly inside the doors of the synagogue, or chevra, with their little children, who clapped their hands and ran up to kiss the scrolls as they passed, and altogether seemed in the seventh heaven of delight. In the great synagogues of the Sephardim and Ashkenazim, the ceremony was grander and more decorous. All the candles were lit, and, experto creed, dripped exceedingly. Twenty or thirty scrolls were taken out of the ark and carried round the Almimar. There is an immense number of scrolls in Jerusalem, for the residents are still as famous for their calligraphy as they have been for centuries, and their work is cheap. Every elder of the synagogue who was honored with one seemed to be a marinu, or ordained rabbi, and their bright robes and cheerful faces showed that, as Heine sings of the Shabbos, on that day each thought himself as happy as a king, forgetful of the squalor and poverty and pain of the everyday life outside. Many of the little boys waved flags of red, blue, white, or yellow silk or stuff. On one side of these banners were printed the verses sung during the Hakafoth, X, Myrwn 7 IE etc., and on the other the arms of Sir Moses Montefiore, the champion of Jerusalem, were fully emblazoned with their supporters, a lion and unicorn rampant, and, on a scroll, his motto, Jerusalem. The Britsker Rav at Jerusalem
Rabbi Judah Leib Diskin, at whose house I saw the Kassidish dance, cannot be dismissed with the above incidental mention. The J. E. Lodi, child, as he was acrostically called, was, indeed, the child of his time and environment. Born at the beginning of the century which in a more western city produced a Heine, the Lithuanian lad was regarded by his Kossidish entourage as hardly less marvelous a genius. His aspirations could not be confined within the mud walls of a Russian village. The Litvak, as the Lithuanian is sometimes in affection, more often contemptuously, called, is a very curious type of Jew, but the Litvak Kossid is more curious and still more redoubtable. There has always been a mystic bent in the Jewish mind, and to this, as Dr. Schechter has shown, Kassidism gives full scope. It is a joyful and emotional sort of religion, not that which appeals to the cold intellect of the porch, or even to the more excitable reasoning powers of the forum. But that it has, caught on, need surprise no one who has watched the gigantic march of the Salvation Army. Diskin soon received a call to Brest-Litovsk, where he became the head and center of the important Jewish community there, all misnagged him and pious, more or less. Nowadays Brest is an important railway junction and military garrison, but in his days it was rather the mother city in Israel than a commercial or political entity. The Britsker Rav, however, soon became a well-known figure throughout the Russian and Polish juries, and, though his geographical connection with Britsk, the Polish name for Brest, ceased nearly half a century ago, it is as the Britsker Rav that he has been proudly designated and revered to an almost sacrilegious point in Jerusalem itself. When Sir Moses Montefiore made his first pilgrimage to Jerusalem there were only 250 Jews there. But their number rapidly increased to many thousands. And as soon as there was a Litvak congregation there worthy of him, they sent for Diskin, and he became their rabbi. His reputation was ever greater than his performance. Yet this by no means implies that he did not amply deserve his reputation for sanctity of life and Talmudical insight. But so far as I can find he never wrote a book. Steinschneider and Lipp, Zedner and Van Stralen are silent in his regard. Bookmaking he left to his enemies. Out of good old-fashioned courtesy to my father's son, he had sent me by way of welcome a gift of cakes and wine. I went to thank him and found him seated in a long fur robe, with velvet beretta trimmed with fur, whilst round and round the room, as above related, there danced the students of his yeshiva, a curious mixture of the howling dervish and German university student. But the old rabbi, with the piercing eyes, beamed at them indulgently, and beamed at me, with perhaps a little more indulgence for that I would not, or could, not, join in their gyrations, or voice their melody. Throughout his long pilgrimage in Jerusalem, and, indeed, almost to the end, the Britsker Rav held religiously aloof from all controversial matters or the war of communal politics, only too prevalent in Jerusalem. It was his boast that he never put pen to paper nor worried about worldly things, he had come to the Holy Land to die there. His wife was, perhaps, a little less old world in her notions. She is the most distinguished lady in Jerusalem. She can pa ken, I was told, as well as any Rav, writes Hebrew in classical style, and talks a little less classical, but quite as intelligible French. Diskin's abstention from controversy is, I am sorry to say, quite unparalleled in Jerusalem, and speaks volumes in favor of his wisdom and good nature. Yet, even his aloofness was not quite to the end. The Russian immigrants into Palestine had started the first of the Kalalim, literally, universities, and initiated the mischievous system of Halukkah. The stay-at-homes remained in close intercourse with their more enterprising brethren abroad, and by way of atonement for their modernity in yielding to the Tsar's reforms, sent monies, city by city, to each of the cities of the university, and these were distributed amongst the students of Talmud and Torah. The principle is, of course, liable to abuse, but it should not be forgotten that it is the same system as supported learning and kept it alive in Paris and in Oxford, in Cordova and Padua in medieval time. The course of Russian persecution had not abetted since Diskin had left home, and emigration had not ceased. But it had taken a new direction, and had crossed the Atlantic, and American Russians or Russian Americans had now become almost as numerous as their brothers at home in Russia, and not less charitable. 
American contributions to Haluka had become very large and important, and yet by the constitution of the Kalalim could not be diverted from the cities of original origin. And so a miniature little American revolution took place in 1897 in Jerusalem, a Kolal America was formed, and the Britsker Rav consented to be nominated as its head. I fear there was a good deal of ill feeling aroused. The nonagenarian chief Rabbi Samuel Salant felt hurt, and, indeed, was said to contemplate the resignation of his office. But the Geld's intervention, though it was probably impersonal, seems a pity. It strikes a discordant note in the harmony of a whole and peaceful life. The Rothschild School in I-888 During my stay in Jerusalem, not a day passed but I paid my friend M. Nisim Behar a visit in the large and commodious premises of the Baron Lionel de Rothschild School, which immediately adjoins the Hotel Jerusalem. Despite the comfort of my bed, I was awakened almost every morning by the sounds of activity raised by M. Behar's little, and big, scholars. Altogether Jerusalem is a very early place. Everybody is up betimes, and morning prayers, including the Dukhan, which in the holy city is an everyday institution, are always over long before seven. Everybody goes to synagogue in Jerusalem, and manages to do so without encroaching on his taskmaster's time. It is the greatest mistake in the world to think that our co-religionists there are idle and do no work, and that the halukkah makes them rentiers and gentlemen at ease. Later on I shall take an opportunity to say something about Jewish trades and tradespeople, and also briefly explain the Haluka system, and show that the ten francs per annum a house father obtains under it is not so very demoralizing and pernicious after all. At present, I propose to tell about the Rothschild school, not so much because from the theoretical point of view it is the best. The German orphan asylum, managed by the estimable Dr. Herzberg, in this respect runs it very close. And the book houses, or Talmud Torah schools, within the walls of Jerusalem, are also in many respects most creditable. But it is in regard to the technical instruction it imparts and its director's practical energy that it is altogether unique. For English Jews, it has the additional interest that it was founded by Englishman Lord Rothschild and Samuel Montague, and that it is mainly supported by English funds. The Anglo-Jewish Association gives it an annual subvention, and so does the Alliance Israelite Universelle in Paris, but, of course, the bulk of the cost is defrayed by its own committee, the headquarters of which are at New Court. The rather cumbrous title of the school is as follows, Institution Israelite Pour Instruction et Le Travail, Foundation, Lionel de Rothschild, but its lengthy name has not stood in the way of its material prosperity. Recent advices from the East inform me that the school has been permitted to acquire for a hundred thousand francs the site of the hotel. Mr. Kamenitz will move nearer the Jaffa Gate, and his guests will no longer have to use the omnibus when they wish to go to the city, nor be disturbed by their industrious but noisy neighbors, nor annoyed by the familiar, though disagreeable, sound of the engine. It is hard to picture to one's self omnibuses and steam engines in Jerusalem, and yet they are prosaic realities introduced by our enterprising brethren, and important factors in the Jerusalem of today. M. Behar has nearly two hundred pupils, of whom a third board at the establishment. There are nearly twice as many Sephardim as Ashkenazim. I was a little sorry to see this, although I feel sure of the absence of any conscious favoritism. There are more Ashkenazim in Jerusalem than their bluer-blooded co-religionists, and, although they may be less desirable in some respects, can vouch for their being quite as eager to become pupils. It was quite a sight to see how M. Behar, whenever he walked abroad, was bombarded with applications for admission to his school. Prayers were always read by the minion at half past five in the morning, and within an hour from that time the classes were all busy, and the workshops alive with the blows of the hammers, and the creaking of the saws, and the puffing of the engine. One can hardly avoid being guilty of rhapsody, when describing the effect produced upon a Western mind by the appearance of Western activity where expectation had pictured to itself Oriental indolence cultivating begging as a fine art. Even in Europe an institution like the Rothschild School would extort admiration. It is more an academy or university than a school in the narrower sense of the word, and its pupils hail from all parts of Asia Minor and Syria, and some come even from Egypt.
languages. The curriculum is extensive, but so far as one could judge not so wide as to prevent the instruction given from being quite as thorough as desirable. Hebrew, Arabic, and French are the languages chiefly taught, and the pupils are permitted to converse in any of these, but jargon, whether Jidish Deutsch or Judeo-Spanish, is strictly forbidden. English is also taught, and, as I understand, by the express desire of the parents, including amongst others no less a personage than His Excellency the Pasha. English-speaking travelers still constitute the bulk of the moneyed travelers to the Holy Land, and therefore English has a practical value. But in this respect Jerusalem is certainly exceptional, for in the East, and even in Egypt, French remains the lingua franca. With regard to French, I can only say that I have never seen a public schoolboy whose accent or grammar could compare with even the youngest of M. Behar's pupil. Perhaps some persons who know may think this only faint praise after all. And as to Hebrew, I feel sure that the average European rabbi would be put to the blush by these little scholars of Jerusalem, whose fluency and elegance of diction make us unable to realize that Hebrew is not a living language. Mathematics and the rudiments of science are not neglected, and, indeed, the only point in which higher education in Jerusalem differs from ours is that we indulge our penchant for Greek and Latin, and they do not. In some of the alliance schools in Asia Minor, Smyrna, for instance, even this qualification does not apply, so far, at least, as Greek is concerned. The Workshop The workshops were highly satisfactory. The Mechanical Engineering Department, under Mr. Price, an able young Mechanician, who was sent out to Jerusalem by the Anglo-Jewish Association, looked particularly businesslike. It seemed a little strange that the engine was fed by olive wood as fuel. The woodwork and carving were also interesting, the artisans showing great zeal, and seeming to glory in their work. The tailoring and bootmaking shops were also busily employed. What most struck me, was the fact that the technical classes were not merely, as in the People's Palace for instance, for the purposes of education. They were also to a great extent self-supporting, and were largely patronized by the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Indeed, complaints were made to me by a deputation of artisans in the city that they were being undersold by the school. I investigated the matter, and found that, so far from this being the fact, the school really exacted and obtained higher than the average price for its work. I saw iron bedsteads being manufactured, wheels of carts mended, the familiar olive wood curiosities being turned, and boots and clothes being made, all to order and for remunerative prices. With regard to the latter trades, it should be observed that they are not open to the same objections as in England. Jerusalem has practically no export trade, and its artisans must therefore supply home wants. The population is increasing, and there is already a fair field for the employment of all those who are being trained. The classes most particularly interesting were those for drawing and sculpture, the latter recently endowed by Baron Edmund de Rothschild, whose visit to Palestine, with the Baroness, last year was epic-making. Here one saw work which evinced a large amount of talent and creative skill, work which would not have disgraced South Kensington. Among the most artistic workers in stone were some Russian refugees, of whom there are several in the school. Two of these pupils, Bershawski and Lemberg, I found hard at work in the city, in the Via Dolorosa, carving the corbels of the Russian convent buildings, which were soon to be opened by the Archdukes Paul and Sergius. It seemed grim irony of fate that the authorities of the Greek Church, despite their known anti-Semitic prejudices, should have been forced to call in the aid of the very men whom persecution had compelled to flee from the dominions of the prince's brother, but who were the only persons in Jerusalem who could do artistic work of the character required. Happily other and more inerciful counsels now prevail, and the governors of the various Russian provinces have received written instructions from St. Petersburg to stay their hand. The pupils. With regard to the locale of the school, it is essentially the right thing in the right place. On the Jaffa Road, about 10 or 12 minutes walk from the gate, it is the first conspicuous building passed by every pilgrim to the holy city. 
It is not too far from the city to prevent the young inhabitants from availing themselves of its advantages, and, so far as I could ascertain, they are never kept by distance from being either punctual or regular. Above all, it is in the center of the new Jerusalem without the walls, which is rapidly springing up, and which relieves the pressure within. There are already about eight or nine thousand suburban inhabitants. The pupils are of various ages and various sects of religious thought, and, to my mind, nothing will serve better than this mixture to remove the bitterness of the odium theologicum, which is so unwelcome a feature in the holy city. As in the great universities of the Middle Ages, there are fathers of families there who think it no disgrace to join the classes. Thus, a staid notary of Islam, before whom I had one afternoon to appear in the surreal to get him to legalize a power of attorney, I found next morning seated on the schoolboy's bench learning French. Of course, the large majority, especially in the theoretical classes, are young. Among them is Osman Bey, the son of Riyuf Pasha, the governor of Palestine. His standard of cultivation may be gauged by the fact that he plays Madame Behar's piano and is an enthusiastic collector of coins. He was delighted with the gift of a Roman cestus I had picked up near the steppe pyramid of Saqqara. Sephardim and Ashkenazim meet on a footing of complete equality, and there are several Christian, and more Mohammedan pupils. As none of the Jews are in a position to pay, M. Behar cannot exact payment from the non-Jews, but I believe some of the Christians have volunteered payment. Their number is, of course, relatively very small. When in Jerusalem I was especially struck by the cordial relations now existing between the rabbis and M. Behar, whose conduct has converted their former distrust into confidence. It is also a pleasing feature in the schools that just as they draw their material, not only from Jerusalem, but also from Hebron and the agricultural colonies, so their scholars, when trained, do not all remain to stagnate there, but go afield to other parts of Palestine, to Syria, and even to Egypt. The school premises are admirably adapted for their purpose, but every inch of space is occupied, and if, as I hope, provision will be made eventually for the board and lodging of some of the country pupils, the proposed extension will have become necessary. The Orphan School and Others The Weisenhaus, or Orphan Asylum, on the Jaffa Road, directed by Dr. Herzberg, is a most creditable institution. It is the only Jewish boarding school in Jerusalem and is thoroughly well managed. I was sorry to miss Dr. Herzberg, who was in Europe at the time of my visit. He is a man in a thousand, as his writings testify, and one whom we must be proud to call our co-religionist. His wife is a second mother to the pupils, and they evidently love her dearly. I went there on Saturday, so did not find them at their studies, but the bedrooms were nice and airy, with whitewashed walls and ceiling, and not crowded like the dormitories of our own public schools. In general, one cannot give a very good account of the climate of Jerusalem. But that, as I shall show later, its shortcomings are remediable appears from the fact that, except in the rainy season, the teacher, Miss Cohen, who was trained at Jews College, London, and therefore acclimatized in this country, manages to sleep if the open air on the leads outside one of the rooms. The pupils learn English, German, and Arabic, but no French. This seems a pity, for, although French may not be indispensable, German is quite useless. An evening school for the young artisans of Jerusalem has just been started in Jerusalem in connection with Dr. Herzberg's school, and it is very successful. The Blumenthal School accommodates about a hundred pupils. It is directed by Rabbi Isaac Prager, and of his pupils' Hebrew and Arabic calligraphy I carried away some lovely specimens. I can only just refer to the Sephardi in Ashkenazi Talmud Torah schools, each with its 300 pupils. The latter is under the supervision of the chief rabbi Samuel Salant, who bears his years lightly, and who struck me as particularly clever. Here I found the only trace of Pharisaism which I met in the course of my visit, and even this was of the mildest possible type. We came to a class where a boy was translating, or rather reciting a passage out of PBNPRA in the treatise Sanhedrin. I asked him to turn over, in the famous introduction by Maimonides, to that chapter in which he deals with the various theories of the afterlife. The teacher hesitated and elevated his eyebrows.
I saw that he did not feel satisfied in his own mind as to the orthodoxy of the Rambam's philosophy, and, snubbed, I withdrew. Besides these, there are many Talmud Torah and other schools for Jewish children in Jerusalem, over 80 for boys and about 20 for girls. With the exception of the Evelina Rothschild School for Girls, none of these are intended for more than 40 pupils, and most have not even half that number. They are in fact like the Chadarim in Whitechapel or any other ghetto, and it is to be feared that in most cases their instruction is limited to parrot-like reading of the Hebrew scriptures and prayer book. Climate and Sanitation The awfully sudden death of the Crown Prince Rudolf of Austria will be deeply felt by our Jewish brethren in Palestine. He visited the Holy Land when only 19 years old, and his, Journey in the East, published in 1884, bears testimony to the extreme interest he took in Jews, and the cordial goodwill he bore them. When in Jerusalem he was present at the Seder given by the late Chachambashi, and the ceremony made a deep impression upon him. As a memento of the hospitality he had enjoyed, he presented the venerable rabbi with his portrait and autograph, and the picture was treasured by him as one of his dearest possessions. On board ship I met a man, now in the employ of the Austrian consul at Beirut, who had accompanied the prince as Jaeger, or body servant, during his travels in the east. He told me many a story of his imperial master's reverent interest in the holy places, and of his invariable good humor in difficulties and disagreeable. Although so active a sportsman, he suffered in health when in Palestine. He was struck down by fever while on his way to Nazareth, and to his great disappointment was obliged to embark at Haifa without completing his program. From various causes the death rate at Jerusalem is, to European notions, abnormally high. It is not by any means an unhealthy place for visitors, far less so, for instance, than Rome, and if they stay outside the city walls they may escape even the mosquitoes. But the residents are great sufferers, hardly anybody escapes fever once or twice a year, ophthalmia is caused by the glare of the sun against the white stone walls, and the chilly mornings and evenings are accountable for a good deal of rheumatism. Even the Talmud refers to the delicate health of Jerusalemite children as notorious, and it would appear to be still worse nowadays. It is particularly painful to see the puny in wizened babies, and boys, and girls sharp and clever but looking prematurely old. The offspring of two early marriages is always sickly, but the chief causes of the ill health are the poorness of the water supply and absence, or rather presence, of drainage. Both defects could be remedied without much difficulty. As to the drainage, the cesspool system could, one would think, be easily replaced by canalization. The valleys of Jehoshaphat and Hinnom, Gehenna, the traditional limbo of the damned, are no longer so deep as they used to be in the days of yore. The numerous layers of debris now enable one standing in the valley to touch with an umbrella Robinson's Arch, the starting point of the famous bridge which connected the temple with the Mount of Olives. And yet Josephus tells us that the depth was so great that no one could stand on the bridge and look down without b. 70 Jews in many lands, coming giddy and afraid. Still the fall from the inhabited heights to the natural moat surrounding the city is large enough to be of use for drainage purposes. The Dung Gate, the Ninawan Ayu, with its now blocked up cloaca, leading to the altar in the temple courtyard, is sufficiently near to show that such methods of sanitation were not unknown to King Solomon 3000 years ago, and the Turks have much to do to make up for the ground they have lost since then. Underground Jerusalem To my mind the most wonderful object in Palestine is Underground Jerusalem. This is formed by the royal quarries cut in the solid sandstone rock, when Solomon obtained the massive stones of his temple, and whence the material was brought with which a new Jerusalem was built fourteen separate times. They are of huge extent, and form a network of long and wide but intricate galleries with which the rock is honeycombed. The labyrinth is entered by a narrow passage near the Damascus Gate. Formerly it was left open to anybody who chose to enter, and the maze to which it led was inhabited by gypsies, even in Jerusalem there are gypsies, and other vagabonds. Jerusalem is a garrison city, and the military element there, as elsewhere, often gets into mischief. 
Many a disreputable scene was enacted underground, while official negligence shrugged its shoulders and let it pass. But even Turkish indifferentism was moved from its accustomed equanimity when dynamite was discovered under the surreal. The danger of a real blowing up, by European methods, was more potent than the reproach of Europeans, and the Aegean stable was straightway cleansed and emptied. It has been empty ever since, the entrance is always barred and locked, and the keys are forthcoming only in exchange for bakshish. There were five of us who entered, each with a burning candle, and in solemn silence we followed our guide as he led us down a slippery incline, far away to beneath the very site of the temple. The transition from the noise and the glare and the dust outside was very impressive. No catacombs could appear so much a city of the dead as these immense quarries which undermine all Jerusalem. One could trace the marks of pickaxes on the rocks all around, and gradually realize what an immense amount of labor was involved in thus hollowing out Mount Zion and the other sacred hills. Here at last one could think and live through our history once again. In Jerusalem itself one is too much distracted by the importunities of dragomans and the innumerable sights to be seen. And even here our daydreams were soon rudely broken. All at once our guide discovered that he had lost his way, and we had to blow out all our candles but one, so as to economize our light in case we might have to spend many hours before finding our way out. Luckily even this adventure ended in a commonplace manner and the sound of trickling water put us on the right track once more. We found large ponds of water, like the subterranean lakes in a salt mine, only the water was not dot briny, but fresh and sweet. Evidently it is here that one should seek for the springs that supplied Jerusalem in its halcyon days, and fed the famous pool of Siloam. Even now, there is an endless quantity of water in underground Jerusalem, and it would cost but a small sum, 30,000 pounds or so, to make a permanent water supply. Some years ago Lady Burdett Coutts offered to defray the cost out of her own pocket, but political motives, or possibly carelessness, induced the Turks to decline her noble offer. However, the present Pasha told us that should such an offer be repeated under his regime, he would gratefully accept it. Hospitals However easy it may be to improve the health conditions of Jerusalem, its unhealthiness is the unfortunate fact of today. Hence the number of its hospitals. There are no less than eleven, besides four dispensaries. Of these, the largest is the Russian hospital, with seventy-five beds. Practically, each nation and, indeed, denomination has a hospital of its own, English, American, Greek, German, and soon. The lepers' home of the Hernhuter Brethren, with twenty-three beds, is a gruesome link with the past. But we Jews are particularly interested in four asterisk institutions, the new Rothschild Hospital Extramuros, the Bicker Cholim, Hospital of the Ashkenazim, the Mizgab Ladakh of the Sephardim, and the English Mission Hospital for the Jews. The new hospital, about ten minutes' walk outside the Jaffa Gate, is a really beautiful building, fitted with all modern improvements. It stands in the best situation for air, drainage, and water that could be found within an hour's radius of Jerusalem. It is surrounded by an open space of about twelve acres, which is partly to be planted with eucalyptus trees, and partly to be converted into a fruit and flower garden. To English ideas, the cost of erection, 68,000 francs, seems ridiculously small. The land was bought about six years ago for 30,000 francs, but it has, since then, much increased in value. In fact, since the building has been finished, the French consul, who was the original vendor of the land, in vain offered to buy it back again for 148,000 francs. It has space for 52 beds, or even more. Every regard seems to have been taken about Kashrut, and the shul with its three fine scrolls would be a credit to the most orthodox. All the registers, patients' cards, prescriptions, labels, etc., are printed in Hebrew. It is entirely supported by the munificence of the Rothschild family, and Baron Alphonse has given particular instructions that it is to be conducted quite seal and less reglas of the Shulchan Aruch. Dr. Darbila The managing physician is Dr. Israel Gregory D. Arbila, who is a veritable Jewish hero of romance. 
He was born in Russia, studied in the Imperial Military Medical School of St. Petersburg, and afterwards at the University of Rome, of which he is an M.D. During his seven years military service he was wounded on the battlefield, and is one of the few Russian Jews decorated by the Tsar for personal gallantry. He spent a short time at Cairo, where the Khedive made him a bay, has been in India, and in Natal, where he practiced as a physician for a year. For seven years, from 1880, he lived in Zanzibar, with the rank of a general, surgeon major of the Sultan's army, and his private physician. In that capacity he was able to do much for the advancement of civilization, and rendered good service to British interests, as Sir John Kirk has testified. He vaccinated all the dusky members of Stanley's following when underscore that adventurous traveler started on his last journey into the interior of Africa, and was the last European to bid him farewell. The great explorer confided to him that he had other objects in view, besides that of relieving Emin Bay. Accordingly, in October, 1888, the doctor could assure me that Stanley was safe, when everybody else gave him up for lost. Darbila has seven or eight decorations from various European sovereigns, and his inlaid guns and diamond-hilted sword are a sight to see. He is a man of means, and the primary object which prompted him to settle in the Holy Land was his desire to assist in the 5XQW Pax A, and to give his dear little girl and boy a Jewish education. His dark bright-eyed little daughter is sweetly pretty, and speaks English with charming shyness. She is only seven, but has already made a conquest. The doctor takes much interest in his agricultural colonies, and has a considerable pecuniary stake in them. He owns half a million vines in the Rishon colony, and has a profound belief in its future. A brother of his is an artillery engineer in the Russian army, but rather than continue in the service and give up Judaism, as the authorities require him to do, he is going out to Palestine, and will manage his brother's vineyard. Dr. D. Arbila may not be scrupulously observant, according to Jewish notions, but he never eats trifa, nor smokes on Sabbath. He is a handsome, active man, and though he mourns for the wife he has lost, he is too much of an idealist or an enthusiast to be anything but the most agreeable and refreshing of companions. It is no doubt, in some respects, a disadvantage that the new Rothschild Hospital is not inside the town, as the old one was. The bulk of the community lives, of course, within the walls, but there are already 3,000 Jews or more who live outside, within five minutes walk of the hospital, and there is every prospect that any future increase in the Jewish community will be precisely in this neighborhood. Indeed, the special object of my journey was to arrange for the development, by building societies, of the Montefiore estate, which is in the immediate vicinity of the hospital. The plan, if successfully carried out, will lead to the provision of dwellings for a thousand more of our co-religionists. On the whole, except for very serious cases, there will be no difficulty in bringing patients from the very furthest part of the town to this new suburban site. In the palmiest days of its history, it was never more than 25 minutes walk from end to end of Jerusalem, so that the objections to an institution outside the city walls must not be exaggerated. The Missionaries The Missionary Hospital, which accommodates 28 indoor patients, is inside the city, and its object, ever since 1842, when it was established, is, admittedly, to attract Jews, and Jews only, and to seduce, if not coerce, them into Christianity. As Jews, we have the duty to do all in our power to combat the insidious influence of the missionaries, and so the hospital accommodation we should be ready to provide should equal the demand, without regard to the Rothschild Hospital outside the city. Now, the only existing provision is that furnished by the Bicker Cholim, which has thirty beds, and to which an upper story has just been added by the liberality of one Mr. Wittenberg, a resident in Jerusalem. This is not enough, if we have regard to the fact that hospital cases are drafted to Jerusalem from Hebron, Nablus, Saft, and Tiberias. Those from the colonies, whose Jewish population is now close upon 4,000, and those from Jaffa with its 1,500 Jews, will probably go to the new hospital. The only available city site for a new hospital is that of the old Rothschild Hospital, and this has been recently sold to the Sephardi community for 20,000 francs, a third part of its value 
on condition that it should be applied only for the communal benefit. The intention is to erect on it a hospital for the Sephardi-friendly society, called Ms. Gabladak, and manage it on the same lines as the Bikr Cholim, the sister institution for the Ashkenazim. The Sephardim scraped together 10,000 francs among themselves, and have sought a loan of the rest from the Sir Moses Montefiore Testimonial Committee. Meantime the banker, Senior Valero, has advanced the money. Now, there is a fund amounting to about £9,000 collected by our co-religionists in Frankfurt and Amsterdam for the express object of founding and endowing a hospital in Jerusalem. They acquired a piece of land, but, as they could not obtain the Pasha's concession to build a hospital on it, they had to sell the ground they had bought, asterisk it would, therefore, be eminently desirable if they would apply the funds in enlarging, improving, and Europeanizing the Bikr Cholim and the Mizgabladak. They would thus be enabled to supply the existing want, without multiplying institutions or wasting the expenses of a new installation. On my way home to England, I attended a meeting of the committee at Frankfurt, and advocated this view. Our Dutch and German co-religionists are very practical, and I was confident that the common-sense view of the matter would appeal to them, even though it might involve some small sacrifice of effect. Competent persons think the site of the old Rothschild Hospital as suitable as any inside Jerusalem. It overlooks the Dome of the Rock and the Haramesh Sharif generally, as well as the Mount of Olives, and is on the edge of the cliff overhanging the Brook of Kedron at the height of at least 200 feet. The situation is a grand one, but certainly not so healthy as one outside the gates. At present it is a building of only one story, but it has splendid tanks and good water, which did not run dry even during this last year of drought, but occasionally the purchase of water might become necessary. Like all Jerusalem houses, it is built of stone, and has a dome-shaped roof. Indeed, the countless little domes which stud the city give it a curiously characteristic appearance, something like a collection of white beehives or hangcoops. A few houses have flat roofs, but even they conceal a cupola, so that the vaulted rooms are always cool, even in the height of summer. The rooms vary in height, and are arranged without much regard to uniformity, the passages are always exposed to the open air, so that in the rainy season, and in November and December last there seems to have been an abnormal amount of rain, living is rather uncomfortable. However, such as it is, the place after being closed for about seven weeks, when the removal to the Jaffa Road was made, was reopened on Wednesday, the 27th of Tishri, 1888, by the Ms. Gabladak, and the society was good enough to invite me to attend the inauguration. The invitation was printed on a neat little white card and, of course, in Hebrew. The hour fixed was nine o'clock, but as time is a variable quantity in Jerusalem, it was a matter of some little calculation to make out that this corresponded to about two in the afternoon. Clocks It is not a little puzzling to find the clock striking all hours at all times in Jerusalem, so that in that city something like Jules Verne's famous solecism of Big Ben striking twenty minutes to seven could easily be realized. Every ecclesiastical building possesses its own clock, and not only do they not go just alike, but they all differ widely and willfully, so that it seems that clerical disputes are allowed to affect the chronology of every day. I always made my appointments by Frankish time, but an hour's margin was invariably necessary. A couple of American timekeepers bestowed upon Mr. Kamenitz's bright and obliging sons and henchmen, Bezalel and Marcus, will, perhaps, do a little to punctualize their environment. This is not meant to imply that at their own home and hotel their father, or rather their mother, kept the guests waiting for lunch at one, or dinner at seven. Au contraire, the best clock seems to be that we carry within us, and judging by the impartial evidence of the stomach, we can vouch for their punctuality. Our table de heat was always good and plentiful, and it was not without something of a rush that I managed to get to the Ms. Gabladak gathering in time for the ceremony. A meeting. The meeting provided further proof of the cordial relations subsisting between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim, which were as conspicuous as gratifying. The venerable and handsome Chacham Bashi Panazel, the first in Zion, as he is called, was there, with his delegate, 
Har Behar Elias Har, and next to them sat the Reverend Samuel Salant, chief rabbi of the Ashkenazim. Many of the physicians of the city were present, and the lay element was represented by Messrs Valero, Behar, Pines, and others. The proceedings consisted of a long address in classical Hebrew delivered by Mr. Menahem Cohen, the treasurer of the society, and various complimentary speeches, as the custom is on such occasions all the world over, degree and afterwards his successor. The morning's mail had brought the Jewish Chronicle, announcing that Major Goldsmith had obtained his step. The gallant colonel is a great favorite in Jerusalem, and it was quite charming to see the Chachambashi's face light up as I explained to him that the promotion was equivalent to the conversion of a bay into a pasha. Tombs Until one goes to the Holy Land, one cannot realize how numerous are the objects which demand attention. The first impression of the smallness of the country soon wears off when one begins to understand how rich it is in association. To the Jew this is specially noticeable. For myself, I frankly admit that the specifically Christological monuments had comparatively little interest, not that, as a rule, I care for them less, but because I care for our own, our very own, antiquities more. Every inch of the sacred soil is so bound up with our history during and after Bible times, that like the literary ignoramus who found fault with Hamlet because it was so full of quotations, I could hardly help thinking the crowding of effects, the toujours perdricks of sightseeing, quite theatrical. I despair of giving an impression at all accurate of the things seen and to be seen. Take, for instance, the case of sepulchral monument. We all know that, throughout our history, we Jews have deemed it a high privilege to be buried in the Holy Land, and therefore it is not surprising that Palestine in general, and the Godsaker at the foot of the Mount of Olives in particular, form a veritable pantheon of Jewish worthies. As I write, I have before me a catalogue of not less than 290 patriarchs, prophets, and rabbis whose tombs have been identified, and the anniversaries of whose death are celebrated to this day by our co-religionists, who dwell on this the largest Campo Santo in the world. The list is confessedly incomplete, and yet I can only refer to two or three of them, and to those but slightly. King David Sepulchre Of Jewish sepulchres at Jerusalem, that of King David is, of course, of chief interest to everybody, although from the architectural view it is absolutely featureless. It lies to the southwest of Mount Zion, about eight minutes walk outside the Bethlehem Gate. A small mosque and two or three white-domed Mohammedan buildings cover the site, and constitute a little village called the Nebi Dap. For half a piaster, if one is a native, for five piasters, if a tourist, one can enter a room on the first floor in which a sarcophagus is shown. This the custodians assert to be the veritable coffin of the warrior king, and it is, indeed, covered with costly carpets and countless little rags, deposited there by devout Moslem pilgrims. They always thus honor the tombs of their saints, and leave a shred of their clothing, as a European might leave a visiting card, to remind the holy defunct to intercede for them in heaven. The Mohammedans of Jerusalem will not see the absurdity of expecting travelers to believe that the king can be buried on an upper story, but the pasha knows very well that the real tomb is in the vault beneath, cut in the solid rock. Admission to this vault is absolutely forbidden, it is regarded as even more sacred than the cave of Machpelah, and when the Austrian crown prince received a personal firman from the sultan authorizing him to enter, he had to unlock the gates himself, and even the pasha, albeit a governor of the land, with power of life and death, dared not accompany him, because his name was not included in the imperial warrant. Catacombs The catacombs, which the guide books call the Tombs of the Kings, are really the burial places of Kalba Sabua and his family. Readers of Dr. Richardson's Son of a Star will recognize in this man the almost princely father-in-law of Rabbi Akiba. The tombs consist of three square rock chambers with shelves all round, on which traces of richly carved sarcophagi still remain, they lie about five minutes to the north of the Jaffa Road, near what the Arabs are pleased to call the Tower of Goliath, Kalat Jalad. The whole terrain was purchased by our co-religionist, Madame Perrier, in 1867, 
and by her presented to the Empire of France, as the Hebrew inscription on the southeast, the largest, chamber testifies. A good many authorities insist, but I think without sufficient reason, that this is the place of burial of Helena, Queen of Adiabene, whose conversion to Judaism, with her son and successor, in 48, constitutes one of the most charming episodes in the romance of Jewish history. During the excavations made in 1867, and again in 1880, several bones were disturbed, and these were, on each occasion, reverently collected and buried by our people with much pomp. I refer to only one other of these stones crying out, and then pass, reluctantly, to the Jerusalem of today. The cave of Jeremiah is another of those places where the consensus of opinion of Jews, Christians, and Mohammedans, who, despite the independence of their several traditions, concur in treating them as sacred, gives powerful evidence of the truth of revealed religion. Near the mouth of the cavern bloom some of the few fruit trees which are left to remind one of the fertility of the Jerusalem of the past. The place itself I can allow the traveler Henry Mondrell to describe in his own words, the more so as the quotation contains the only reference to Jews the worthy chaplain makes in his whole description of the journey from Aleppo to Jerusalem, which he undertook in 1696. He calls it, a large grot a little without Damascus gate, which is said to have been the residence of Jeremiah, and here they showed us the prophet's bed, being a shelve on the rock about eight foot from the ground, and near it is the place where they say he wrote his lamentations. This place is now a college of dervises, and is much honored by Turks and Jews. Dervishes The Turks, for all their laziness and sensuality, are distinguished by the profound respect they pay to religion, by their dignified demeanor, and by their temperance. With regard to religious matters, I was particularly struck by the solemnity of the howling dervishes, despite the grotesqueness of their performance. In Mohammedan countries the priestly office is not confined to a caste, and any tradesman may become a dervish on high days and festivals without detriment to either his weekday business or reputation. Abunaji, though sheikh of the great mosque of Omar, is nonetheless a shrewd merchant of Jerusalem. He sends his son to the school of Nisim Behar, to whom both he and his son are much attached. On Friday, the September 28, 1888, the lad persuaded his father to have the howling zikr at home and not in the mosque, so that we and other jiars might witness. To my intense astonishment no objection was made to this, and we were able to see the mystic circling and hear the monotonous ejaculations of Allah. Allah. From the vantage point of the roof of an outhouse, while the dervishes occupied the courts below. The ceremony differed from that of either the howling or dancing at Constantinople and Cairo, but its wild, weird movements have been too often described to require repetition. What most struck me was the apprentice system by which quite little boys were permitted to join the circle and imitate their elders, and the sang freud with which Dr. Diarbila watched the epileptic stupor of a tall Nubian, who had been particularly energetic in his zeal and in whom I recognized the porter of the Rothschild school. The comic side of the matter was even more pronounced than in the case of the Kassidish dancers, but though one may have smiled, laughter is not tabooed in Jerusalem, and the irresistible humor of the situation did not and does not prevent one from appreciating the pathos of their devotion and admiring their sincerity. Synagogues Of the synagogues, reference has already been made to the large Sephardi synagogue, Re-Imp, built so long ago as 1556, and the AP Ma, the great shul of the Ashkenazim, built just 25 years ago. Larger than either of these is the Hasidim synagogue, Siao. Nauan, built in memory of Rabbi Israel of Rosen and Rabbi Nisim Bach. The Syrians, the Caucasians, Pyna from Gruria, or Georgia, the Thessalonicans, and so on, have each their own place of worship, so that reckoning the houses of study, what na, there are over sixty synagogues in the holy city. One of the most curious is the tiny little synagogue in the Karite quarter, in which one is credibly informed that they never have minion. About three families live here and provide for all the Karite pilgrims, of whom many come from Egypt and the Crimea in the course of the year. The names of several hundred such pilgrims are written, for a memorial, on the white walls of the little square, or cul-de-sac, 
round which the little karite houses are built. I also saw rudely painted on the wall what was less pleasing, the open red hand with which the superstitious oriental wards off the evil eye. Manasseh ben Israel has a curious explanation of the origin of this, anything but Jewish, symbol, which belongs to the mysteries of folklore. The Karite inhabitants seem to think that they are under a curse in Jerusalem, and that their numbers will never comprise ten men. They are shunned by the other Jews. Their synagogue is at least two hundred years old. The Halukkah system And now a word as to the famous Halukkah system. All monies which are sent to Jerusalem by the benevolent for general objects are paid by the rabbis and treasurers into two common funds, one for the Sephardim and one for the Ashkenazim. The Sephardi theory is that contributions are sent by way of bursaries, as a premium upon learning, and the money is distributed on this basis, and even well-to-do persons accept it lest a slur might be deemed to be cast upon their wisdom. I know of only two exceptions, and one of these used to be like the rest, till his European friends shamed him out of it. No one but the Talmud Chachim is supposed to be entitled to a share in the Halukkah, but a proportion of the fund is set apart for communal purposes and schools. The fund is regarded very much like a university endowment in England. Such a fellowship is obtained by election and by intellectual qualifications, not of a very exhaustive or exhausting kind, perhaps, but certainly not inferior to the composition of Greek and Latin verses or the solution of mathematical puzzles, which used to be the only open sesame at Oxford or Cambridge, and are still the English high roads to advancement in life, social or political. The Ashkenazim, however, retain the theory that the Halukkah is intended as a subvention for the poor, but the practical difference between the two views is not very great. Most people are scholars in Jerusalem, but certainly all are poor, and in this respect the analogy of the medieval university still applies. As I said before, all contributions are earmarked according to their place of origin, and divided among the fellow countrymen of the contributors. For this purpose the Ashkenazim are divided into eight kalalim, or, classes, literally, universities. Each member of the QM 5515, Holland und Deutschland, for instance, receives 250 francs per annum, but these are so well paid only because they are so few that they can be counted with the fingers. The Hungarians get 150 francs, while the men of Warsaw get 40, and those of Pinsk no more than 7 francs a year. But however small the income thus obtained may be, there is a certain amount of regularity about it, which makes it especially appreciated. Unfortunately, it is just this element of regularity that enables the recipients to hypothecate or alienate it in advance and thus deprive themselves of all practical benefit therefrom as an aid to their maintenance. Rents in Jerusalem are not high, five or six napoleons per annum for the average sized house, but they have always to be paid in advance, and to provide this the haluka is often sold three or four years in advance. The system is, of course, pernicious, but it is gradually dying a natural death, and the amount of this unearned increment becomes more and more insignificant every year. Many reasons combine to bring this about. The number of the recipients increases very largely, and the amount of the contributions has decreased in even greater proportions, partly owing to Russian troubles and partly to the specialization of gifts for particular objects, such as schools and hospitals. It would be cruel and injudicious to stop the Halukkah suddenly, and therefore the new society, called Le Mans Zion, though started under high auspices in Germany, is not likely to succeed in its abolition, and the storm of protest it has raised in Jerusalem is really neither surprising nor unjustifiable. Jewish Artisans There are a goodly number of Jewish trades in Jerusalem, as can perhaps be best evidenced by the medical statistics with respect to the outdoor patients of the Rothschild Hospital for the year 1886. In a list of 165 patients, 34 distinct trades are represented, bakers, bookbinders, braziers, clerks, cobblers, cooks, callporters, day laborers, dyers, goldsmiths, hatters, joiners, lithographers, locksmiths, mattress makers, merchants, millers, nurses, printers, polishers, sculptors, tailors, tinkers, 
turners, tanners, watchmakers, and so on. Of course, there are many unemployed. Some can't find work. And others are too old. The longevity of some of the inhabitants is surprising. Many persons, mostly from Russia and Romania, stint themselves all their lives so as to scrape together a little money to take them in their old age to Palestine and support them till they die there. Several instances were pointed out to me of feeble veterans who had reached the holy city seemingly at death's door. The change of climate and mode of life, perhaps their spiritual exaltation, had made them hale and hearty and almost young again. This is end of part two.
This is end of part 2. To listen to the next part, please click on the end screen playlist or video part 3. If you like the story, do not forget to subscribe to our channel and give us a like, it costs nothing, it's all free. Thank you.